There we go. Great. Take um, it away, well, Milo. Grand. Dan, thanks so much. Uh, great to be here, seeing another group of folks who care about democracy uh, and doing something about what they see in the world around them. Um, my name is Milo. I pronounce it Milo. Yeah. You would not I'm know sorry. that there's Milo's all over the world. Uh, so, but I'm a Milo right. and Vasalo. I'm I'm currently uh, live in New York City, um, which is my home, um, and uh, I'm drawn to the kind of work we're doing, coming to it from a place where I was worried about American democracy, the future of planet Earth and climate emergency, and recognizing that having gotten involved in some electoral work, helping candidates, doing stuff, especially mobilized since the, the installation of Donald Trump, which was, I think, a lightning rod to activism for a lot of folks. Um, I had been interested in voter rights after the 2000 election. I, that was something I was a graduate student at the time. So democracy has always been something that I've kind of known I wanted to do something about it. This is purely volunteer, but a passion of mine. And it's recognizing that we're beginning to realize that there are people in this country who have a completely different set of reality. Uh, they're actually living in an unreality. I think we do them in injustice and ourselves in injustice by saying they're living in an alternate reality when they're living in an unreality. We know, I think it's fair to say that. that, that so that consensus uh, is, is something uh, that I think probably I share with you on this group. And so I'd like to run through several slides. Now, I love this subject and I could do a literally thousands of hours. So Dan, I'm gonna ask you to, to be straight with me and tell me how much time I have. And I'd like to, as you said, do a Q&A with the group as well. So uh, I'm here for the duration. I just don't wanna overstay my welcome. Yeah, uh, 10 or 15 minutes for your presentation. And we're gonna have question and answer up to as much as 45 or so. 40. Oh, awesome. Very exciting. So I'll do my yeah. best to limit this to like two per slide. And I'll kind of that was the backstory who I am, why I care about this. Like, I don't feel there'll be any movement on climate or some of the major issues without our democracy actually becoming fully operational again. Uh, not that it was ever perfect, but certainly the way it's headed is very concerning. So that's kind of my own personal why I'm drawn to this. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of the backstory of, if I can share my slides, which you've already empowered me with. Thank you. And I'll just walk through some slides. If there's any pressing questions, if you either want to flag it uh, in the Zoom chat or if you want to raise your hand, it sounds like uh, the good news is, is you all know each other pretty well. So I don't think anyone will take offense. If somebody has a pressing question, they just really need to say, by all means, this isn't a, a formal lecture. So, so just raise your hand. I'll do my best. And if Dan wants to call on somebody, but I'm going to walk you through some slides. So we are the Median Democracy Project and where, where our level of activism and civic work is, is in the exact interface of how media influences democracy, and also to some extent how democracy can influence media. Um, that's how we are going to improve media around us. So the title of this little mini presentation to open is The Media and Democracy Projects, What Activists Can Do. We're very interested in not just talking to our neighbors about media and what's not good about Fox propaganda and why the New York Times is not sufficient to really inform Americans about what's going on in the world, it's really we're trying to find people just like you to think about how your work is impacted by some of the headwinds around the media and landscape around us, how people are influenced by things around them. When, so for example, if you're interested in turning out the vote for the next election, by the time you knock on a door, send a text bank, send a leaflet to someone, they've spent maybe four years since the last election getting bombarded with whatever they're seeing on Facebook, whatever they're turning on the evening news, whatever news organization is in their feeds. And also if they have been basically addicted to right-wing propaganda, what they have been beamed into their minds for years. And when you innocently prince that doorbell and they tell you Joe Biden didn't win the election, uh, that's not, that's, there's a whole series of things that happen to that, uh, uh, to, to get to that point. So that's why we're interested in how media and democracy, but also what are we gonna do about this as opposed to just complain that this is a problem. So we are specifically action oriented. And we see this wonderful Ida B. Wells, investigative uh, woman of color journalist quote to be very powerful. And we're shining this light of truth upon media itself. Uh, we see, we think there's actually significant problems and we're kind of would like to leave you with some ideas of kind of what some of the problems we see are with current media as it informs Americans. Next, 
This is a, uh, a kind of a summary of our philosophy, and I'll just read it out loud, and I'm happy to share with Dan a copy of the slides for you folks to see later. This is somewhat of our mission statement and our working mission statement, is we see an informed citizenry as the bedrock of a democratic society. The information we receive from news and media affects our opinions, our voting decisions, our degree of civic engagement, and ultimately shapes the health of our society and collective futures. Um, our current media landscape is the consequence of legislative decisions that promoted deregulation and consolidation and left the informing of Americans to market forces. Um, corporate media's prime directive, this is ABC, CBS, NBC, a lot of the media that maybe years ago had a different function, but right now it has been consolidated to the point where its prime directive is really to reach as many people as possible and to sell ads and to kind of just perform not primarily a service, but to use media as a kind of a means to an end, as opposed to informing citizens. Um, and so we see corporate media as prime directive to reach as large an audience as possible, conflicting with the handling of increased authoritarianism, immunizing folks to disinformation, addressing structural white supremacy. And in doing so, it actually reinforces the status quo and it's a barrier to essential progress. Um, at present, corporate media, in our opinion, is failing our democracy. We need rapid changes and also legislative solutions that in the long term will favor pro-democracy and a democratized media. I'll just use a quick example of this, is that Donald Trump is being considered a legitimate presidential candidate of the United States by all major news outlets. They're not providing the context of his criminality, depravity, and also his psychological unfitness that we've all demonstrated and he's demonstrated and we've seen now for almost a decade, um, and that yet he is in one breath just the leading candidate for president. And we see that as a problem. If media was primarily involved in informing Americans about these issues of the candidates, they'd provide really important context. Um, that's a, one example, but there are plenty of other examples. So this example is something that's very striking, and, and this is the challenge that we face, is this is a Monmouth University poll from 2021 not far after the election that polled, you've probably seen some data like this, that polled Americans with a legitimate polling organization and of how they saw about six months after the insurrection, what, what happened in the 2020 election and who won. So just to read some of the, the high points here is Democrats felt that Joe Biden won the election fair and square, 90% of them. I don't know what the other 10% were thinking, uh, but then 57% of Republicans believe that the president of the United States, Joe Biden, was elected due to voter fraud. Now in Ohio, you folks have a disproportionate impact in terms of on the front lines of fighting voter suppression and dealing with how Republicans have weaponized this concept of voter fraud um, to serve a means to an end. Um, but this is really jarring because this is not reality. This, to, this is really an example of these folks are not living in reality. There is no voter fraud that made Joe Biden president, right? Period. So when we deal with that 50% of Republicans, our neighbors, friends, families are living in a universe that they think that there's a fraud, that's also setting them up for other stuff, which is what we're dealing with now two years later. But how did these 57% of people come to believe this? That's the question. They didn't divine this. They didn't count the votes themselves and believe this. They were told this. There's a powerful right-wing media ecosystem that insulates them, gives them propaganda, creates an unreality to them. But unfortunately, there's also a corporate media infrastructure, massive ways that most people get free information that isn't doing an adequate job to tether these people and ground them in reality to counter the, a lot of the power of the right-wing ecosystem. And there is not much freely available nonprofit public information. Um, and so that's something we see as part of the problem here is there's right-wing disinfo, corporate media not immunizing people to disinfo, and there's not enough of the neutral, just fact-based nonprofit information like other countries do. So um, so this is kind of the some of the, the highlights is we consider that we are in a narrative or an information war, trying to convince people why it's important to do something about reproductive rights, why it's important to do something about the climate emergency. People are forming opinions. And a lot of those opinions, there is a right-wing powerful factory that is creating narrative. And we are trying to create our own narrative. So information war makes it sound truly antagonistic, 
But right now, Republicans have built a massive infrastructure. They own television networks like Fox. They have built gigantic platforms and social media, like, and they've created uh, influencers like Dan Bongino and these other folks, and they've supported the formation of people that create this an information network to basically create narratives that support a certain agenda. So, well, so what this information war or narrative war is the right wing right now has recognized this for a long time. I'll put a pin in a book if there are folks on this call who want to read a really powerful book. It's called The Shadow Network by Ann Nelson. She's a Columbia journalism professor who's written extensively. And the title of her book is Shadow Network. And it has to do with a explicit strategy now almost 50 years ago, where a small group of right-wing folks recognized that it was going to be essential to build media infrastructure to influence electoral outcomes down the line. And they've effectively done that. So Ann Nelson is an, an, an esteemed journalist and Shadow Network would be a great place if you, I don't know if you do book clubs or something, but if you want to just jump to the head of the class on kind of why the right wing seems to have such great messaging points and everyone stays on point and how come when you turn on the radio in your car, you're listening to like three different right wing conservatives. I'm sure you probably have that in, 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 in Ohio. And it's not because there are more conservatives in Ohio than, you know, Democrat uh, or Democratic or progressive. It's that they have invested in the messaging infrastructure called radio. They own it. Uh, is that fair to say? Do you think you have many progressive or liberal radio stations on the dial in Ohio? I know they don't in Wisconsin. We've done no. some work with groups. <laughs> right. So, but you probably turn on the dial and you've got three to th at least three right wing, probably partially syndicated, you know, right wing folks. Is that fair? Well, well, NPR is a little bit more toward the middle, at least. Well said, Ruth. That's the idea is we consider NPR actually somewhat in the truth based or kind of relatively neutral center. It certainly isn't left or liberal uh, in the in the yeah. in the sense of its politics coverage. It may be progressive in some of its social stuff and classical music and, you know, LGBTQ rights and music and yeah. arts. Yes, it's left in that regard. But in politics, it is not left. They're not talking to left politicians at the, at the no. In no. an excess of, of no. centrist or right. So, mm -hmm. but right. So, is it fair that you have at least a couple right wing consistent radio stations on the dial there? Oh, that's, definitely. That's yes. not random. That is not random. No. It has literally been con by design. And that's something that A, we need to understand the headwinds and why it's what, how people, 57% of Republicans think Joe Biden didn't win, is they're turning on the car when they're driving, then they get home with dinner, they turn on Fox propaganda. And what Ann Nelson calls, which is a brilliant turn of phrase, uh, a phrase is she calls it wallpapering information. Just like you've got wallpaper on all four of your walls and you turn around, it all looks the same. So people can feel like they're getting different news. Uh, they may subscribe in New York City, the New York Post, which is owned by Rupert Murdoch, that they want, they read on the train. If they're in the car on the, on the, on the weekends, they're gonna listen to right-wing radio. And then they're going to turn on Tucker and, and Laura Ingram and then listen to Dan Bongino podcast. So it feels like they're getting four different sources that reinforce the exact same agenda. All of that has been built by design with decades of planning and Nelson Shadow Network. So the point is, uh, this has been constructed and the right wing has built some very big advantages. And some of that has to do with technology. It used to be difficult. You used to have to print thousands of newspapers to reach people, but now a small group of people can actually make radio content, podcasts, and syndicate it. And they just buy a couple of radio stations and they can get their content mm -hmm. coming from two or three uh, sources and pump that into 50 different media uh, uh, markets, right? And that's what, they're, that's what they're effectively doing in any event. So um, I'll leave, I'll skip this. I just saw this will be one of the slides you get, but this is this is an information war and the right has built an advantage. Um, and we're seeing it explicitly now in the courts uh, and seeing how this media corresponds to uh, changes. And I, I call it hijacking of the machinery of our democracy. This kind of what you see in Ohio, uh, you see gerrymandering and you see using the state to change the rules uh, and specifically. 
in any event, next slide. This is one of our mantras that we'll share with you. There's a, a, a brilliant communications and uh, professor named Bob McChesney. Uh, and this is really our North Star of why we do what we do. No matter what your issue, climate, repro rights, racial inequality, unless there's a change in the media, you're basically running up against headwinds. You're gonna to have to address media as part of the solution. And so we just, we like to share this with folks as this is something that we face. So once again, for those who can't see it on their phones, maybe whatever your first issue of concern, media had better be your second because without change in the media, progress in your primary area is far less likely. Bob McChesney, it turns out, he's gonna come and be speaking to our group for the second time in a few years next Tuesday. I don't wanna steal folks from your call next Tuesday, but we're gonna try and record it. But uh, Bob McChesney is someone who should put on your radar screen. He's written about literally 20 or 30 books about media and democracy. Uh, one's called Dollarocracy and, the, and, and very useful information in this subject area. So who are we and what do we do besides uh, care passionately about media and democracy? So we're a grassroots all volunteer organization. We're an offshoot. There were several of us who were involved in the, the the campaign for Senator Warren when she was initially uh, running for, for, for president. We were inspired by this concept of the connectedness of things. Uh, and as an offshoot of that community, we said this, the, I think that the, the personal piece for me was that uh, her plans for Medicare for all received tremendous blowback, uh, even though she had funding in them. Uh, and it was the way it was portrayed was very jarring. Media kind of really savaged her and savaged her plans, especially Medicare for all, which I thought was, uh, was a problem. Um, but some of us really started to think about, well, me, me, how do we fix media? Like, why are we not having honest conversations about healthcare in America and Medicare for all? And how do we get to a place where Americans can be covered? We know it can be done. Um, and so that started as an activist community. Now that's built to where we're not part of anything related to Warren specifically, but that's its origin story. We've got a newsletter that goes out to about 5,000 people. We're active on social media. We find Twitter to be very helpful and we have special events with special guests and we do screenings like we had Andrea Chalupa who did a great movie called uh, Mr. Jones about how propaganda in Russia uh, in the early Soviet Union kind of hid the Holodomor genocidal starvation war by Joseph Stalin in Ukraine, which is now very uh, appropriate as this similar genocidal war on Ukraine is happening again. Uh, so, but we invite special guests and Ann Nelson, whose book I mentioned and put as a mandatory read for people who want to learn more about this, uh, came and spoke to our group and we have did a joint session with U.S. Senator Sheldon Whitehouse. You know, as those who have been following, he's been very interested in dark money. And a lot of what dark money does to leverage its dark money power is media. You can buy a very powerful influence by buying media and influencing by ad buys and that sort of thing. So media ownership is messaging power and the right has recognized this. And we had a great event in Sheldon White House uh, about the, this issue. Um, so this is a highlight, it's a lot, it's a very busy slide. So what do we actually do around media? So a couple of things, in fact. So a couple, number one is we like to train people's muscles to see the role of media. Media, when you turn on the TV, that is the consequence of legislative decisions, regulatory decisions, and business decisions. So the evening news content, it's gonna be a shooting, it's gonna be a cat goes up a tree, it's gonna be keep consuming, you know, keep people interested, it's gonna be inflation. I'm sure pretty much everybody in this call was kind of infuriated with how the inflation drum beats beat until election day. And then it's like, oh, right, let's move on. That, that is the power of media. There are people that there are decisions being made to reinforce these narratives and this information war. So we want to train people to see that when you look at the front page, humans made that decision. Well, what humans made that decision? Editors. Well, who hired the editors? The publishers. But who hired the publishers? The owners. Oh, now we're beginning to see why the front page of the New York Times has had zero stories calling out Republican racist voter suppression in the last two years on the front page of the New York Times. Considering, considering the overt assault on black voters and people of color's ability to participate in their democracy in the last two years, that is appalling. But in fact, they've gone as far, and we track this on the front page of the New York Times, we have a little project tracking the front pages. They've gone as far as to blame Biden for not doing enough to support black Americans right to vote. So in any event, we train people to see these sorts of things and to be more demanding consumers. So what does that mean? 
Well, first things first, we did a, a very exciting, we did a, a position statement heading into the 2020 election where we demanded better coverage and it had multiple points. And we got some thought leaders, some professors and some media folks to co-sign that letter. And then we sent that to all 20 news networks, sorry, uh, top 10 news networks that we, their CEOs, their, you know, their management, uh, the E-suite. Uh, and we also use that to share with other folks to start seeing that media needs to do more to center democracy in their media coverage, right? There is no both sides to authoritarianism and democracy, but we need to get, we need to make it clear to journalists, editors, and publishers that they need to play a more active role. So we got some play with that, so to speak, some engagement. We actually want people like you to write letters to the editor when you see bad coverage. So being part of a sophisticated consumer is to say, why are we not talking about black voters? Or why are we talking about Joe Biden and not the Republicans that are suppressing black voters? Uh, so we as a community workshop, the concept of writing op-eds and letters to the editor about coverage. So we consider ourselves one, accountable, informed uh, One moment, Mila. I see Marty has yeah. her hand up. Yeah, I just, I just wondered, you said you sent us out to 10 uh, media outlets and I wondered who they were. So it's like ABC, CBS, New York Times, Washington Post, CNN, um, I think that I, I apologize. It was it's 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 escaping me. But it was the the major what we consider the 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 top most influential media organizations, and we sent them the the I'll, I'll share since since that yeah. was a question. I, I I don't off the top of my head. Uh, this is going to our website. Um, where yeah, we I, I, I kind of wondered about NPR and PBS. Good question. You know what? I think we did do NPR. I don't think we did. P we did do, you know what? We did both. Sorry. Okay. Good. We did do both. This wasn't just the, it's, um, so here we go. This was our action and this was our open letter to distributed. So basically these were the requests and we workshop this as a group. Number one, make threats to democracy clear. Election liars are on the ballot. Identify them and use the word lie. Two, cover the big lie fuel attack on election integrity and voting rights. Inform voters of the freedoms they can expect to lose under MAGA Republican extreme governance. Abandon false equivalence between normal candidates and anti-democracy Republicans as that normalizes election lies. And forcefully denounce candidates who call or condone, call for or condone violence. And then we explain all of this and we had a petition and we got people to sign the petition and then we posted that petition. So that's kind of somehow we build community around this stuff. So presumably if this is up your alley as it were, we'll keep you with next because we're planning on updating this. This was for 2020. But there's obviously elections coming up. And so we'll bring this to you and to Dan and, and Constance and say, listen, if you folks want to sign on, then you can sign on. And we build, we're building coalition around media issues. And obviously it's more powerful the more people and more groups that sign. So yes. Uh, and and did, did we get much response? Candidly, no. But this did on social media. Uh, not that that's the real world, but in terms of engagement, we are running with the the community of media accountability folks and medium criticism folks. And it it was, we made some graphics to share and we got some engagement. And once again, our goal is we realize this is the long game. We realize the CEO of CBS who hired one of Fox lead reporters, Catherine Herridge to run the evening news and the Sunday shows, getting our, 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 our petition or our open, our mission statement is not gonna turn his business-minded decisions around. But one of the biggest things is to get other people to even see this as a form of activism. Mm -hmm. It's to not be a passive consumer. This, you know, the CBS has become what Fox was 15 years ago. CBS now is unfortunately becoming at present. Um, so we do this. We do letters to the editor. We've also come out with rubrics. And I wanted to, and in, 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 in exchanging information with Dan. So we have grown. There's certain subjects. Number one, democracy, climate crisis and abortion rights coverage have been abominable in terms of actual properly framing the issue for readers. This, this is mostly, but it's, it reflects also in TV journalism. It's a lot easier in print because then you can actually read. Uh, uh, so some, most of our work in terms of that sort of accountability is done um, to the written word, so to, to, to news organizations, New York Times, Washington Post, that sort of thing. So what we've done to help people uh, we want people to be in the trenches. So when you see a paper, an, an article tomorrow that has inadequate coverage specifically of abortion rights, so we've made this format for you. 
and this literally is on the website. I'll put the link in this in the in the slides. But this is demand more truth in context and reporting. Whoops, sorry. Uh, about abortion rights. Ask journalists and editors and media outlets to do better. Become an engaged consumer of information. And we walk through when you see poor coverage, take action. That's what we want is to remind folks. It's action when you write a letter to the editor. It's and you can do that. And it, and it actually works. And we've had a bunch of our uh, groups, letters to the editors published across the country because this is a local action. So you're more likely to have your letter to the editor published in your you know, local gazette than you are in the New York Times or Washington Post. But it's also more powerful because your community sees what you've written, where you stand, and, and you're more likely to get it published there. So what we've done is we went through and made a little rubric. This little rubric down here is, are you angry about how media covers abortion? And I was gonna, since Dan said, I think folks have been thinking about repro rights issues in your group recently. You could add this to your repertoire of what your community is gonna do about repro rights. Besides legislative stuff and legislation and candidates, you can actually make media accountability and nudging media to do better as part of your action plan. So I'll read this a bit for you just so you get a sense of this idea. Five criteria to know when you write a letter to the editor. There's not enough people have done this. It seems like, you know, I'm curious, do, does anyone here write letters to the editor? Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. I walked. Yeah, I walked. we do. <laughs> oh, I see. You already have the muscles. Good. So that's awesome. So 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 this idea is so you've already on this. So I won't spend too much time, but it's helpful to have a little guideline that you can follow, especially if it's subject related. So we have one here for repro rights. Number one, abortion is healthcare. Pregnancy is a medical condition and abortion is intervention for it. Journalists should take the same approach they would with cancer, diabetes, and other conditions and treatments. Focus on mortality risk, patients right to care and bodily autonomy. Two, abortion is economic equity. Abortion is racial equity. Abortion isn't a both sides issue. And it talks and like the numbers are they're you know pretty staggering compared to where what's where states are going in terms of what the consensus is about abortion access and rights. And then ab ending abortion means criminalization. And when we wrote this, this was like a, a, it seemed like this was a far off thing. And we put this together just over a year ago. But now it literally is another aspect of this is criminalization of I mean, I'm sure you've seen in Idaho this idea that like if you take if you take your partner to another state to get an abortion, you're both now in a potentially legal jeopardy for interstate transfer for an abortion. Like, so, Greg. I saw a hand up. Greg, Greg. You're on mute, Hope, Greg. Sorry about that. Hopefully in the state of Ohio, we have a constitutional amendment that we're signing petitions for right now. And I don't know if everyone has seen um, these billboards around town, but one of the billboards says the, the biggest um, killer in the African-American community is abortion. And that, that billboard pisses me off. But when I tried to do research to find out like what percent of abortions are in, within the African-American community, I keep coming up to, to not finding any information. So I think part of our issue with trying to hold media accountable is actually trying to get the facts somehow, some way. So when you're coming up against a, a billboard like that, that you know is wrong, where do you go to get the, I mean, I know this is a general question, but where can we go to get more information on things like that? So a couple of things. I, uh, the billboard itself, I know you know, is not media. That is basically a, I call that guerrilla messaging, which is something we emphasize in our group, similar to banner drops, demonstrations, protests, that sort of stuff. It is somebody has funded that and their, their, the criteria for that sort of thing is zero. It can be, I'm sure you've seen even more jarring, you know, at. So that's basically a propaganda billboard that there's no, unfortunately, that, is, that somebody paid for that. Uh, and so calling that out, I know you're thinking of how do you, where, I guess the question is, is this is the challenge, is that's why I call that guerrilla messaging, is that as somebody that reaches everyone, you can't choose not to see it. Um, and, it, and, it and it breaks through people's information silos. Um, and so I think that's something people uh, in the pro-democracy world should be doing more of. Um, because it actually is, I think, useful, especially as people are getting more and more information digitally, those, uh, uh, these, those interspersed uh, kind of strange ideas, um, but that actually resonate some truth, like, 
you know, something like Republicans are coming to steal your social security and have no plans to save planet earth from the climate emergency. Uh, yeah, that would work um, in any event. So, so where to get facts on those sorts of things agreed. We spent some time kind of coming up with some of these numbers um, off the top of my hand. I, I, I think probably NARAL probably has some good stuff. Um, but I, I don't know the answer to that specifically. I hear you want to be fact-based, but my answer to some of that is when you're dealing with press, what we're engaging in specifically is the press is very often taking the frame that facilitates the right language and framing. For example, they don't refer to it as abortion rights, right? They'll very often just call it abortion. Um, and they don't use... Um, you know, they'll basically use pro-life as opposed to anti-choice, right? So they frame that choice of framing is where we are specifically engaged in kind of countering rather than trying to counter what is very often disinformation or cherry-picked numbers. It's to really just get some the the media folks to recognize that they are they are intentionally or not by their word choices and language choices making a frame that is prejudiced and they need to do better. Sorry, that was long-winded, Greg. Did that make sense? No, I got you now. Thank you. Okay, sure thing. Marty. Yeah, I, I hate to even say, uh, be the person to say these words, Greg, but um, what right-wingers would tell you is that it's the fetuses, or they would say the babies who babies. died. So that if you count the babies, then that's, you know, some deaths. Sorry yeah. uh, to even say those words, but there you uh, go. So just so you know, the compromised, corrupt, and should be impeached uh, Justice Thomas in one of his dissents recently uh, about um, COVID vaccines wrote what I consider one of the most scientifically unsound things I've ever seen. Uh, and he basically was finding that uh, people should have a religious exemption from COVID vaccines because they were, quote, derived from aborted, I think it was children. Um, and so uh, so the idea being is, yeah, that, but that's the framing of language. That shows the power of language. There's no scientific grounding in these things, but they use yeah. it to frame. And that's what we're trying to prevent journalists from falling into. But that idea of that, that language Marty was talking about, and, and that's where we're at, is journalists are falling into the Republican trap of asymmetric language. Cool. So let's go how onwards. How successful are you? Excuse me. How yeah. successful are you at getting them to correct their language? Or... Good question. So there are a couple couple ways yeah. we do the feedback. So number one, yes. we do the feedback by email. Many journalists actually do publish their emails. They need scoops. They need to be accessible. And I will emphasize that we see journalists as accountable allies. We do not see them as enemies. We do not see them as the problem. They are very often doing their best. They have editors and deadlines. There are some who do not qualify for this. I think there's some people at the New York Times that have done a terrible job covering authoritarianism and Donald Trump for the last six years. So I have a great concern for and do not consider them uh, allies in, in standing up for truth and democracy. But generally speaking, so we do outreach. We'll literally send an email, say, listen, hello, um, Mila from the Media Democracy Project. We've been, you know, we're very interested. We appreciate your work as a journalist. We know it's not easy, but you've chosen this framing. Have, you know, is there a reason you chose this framing as opposed to this framing, which we think is more accurate? I look forward to your response. And we do a reasonable percentage of the time actually get a response. Um, mm. Often we don't. Um, and our job is to nudge. Um, we're not expecting a retraction, um, but we are expecting in future work. Um, and to the point of some of the feedback that we get, like, so for example, I have, there's a New York columnist who I've emailed enough and enough exchanges about this, who's, who literally on one occasion has said, I thought you, I wrote this and I, I had a feeling you were going to, you were going to email me. <laughs> so the, the goal is to build that kind of relationship. And that's why local news outlets, and we're going to talk about our next project is, is very important, is there's some accountability when people get to know you and they understand that you're part of the community and that you're reading their work. So it's creating that new paragraph. We have a colleague in another state who has been part of our community who has built, come, has, in, has similarly to Constance taken the, what we do in our work, I'll just say it, to the next level. Um, she's part of a coalition of activists, an activist community that's involved in peace um, and peace projects 
it's faith organizations, it's racial justice organizations, and they meet periodically, and they formed a subgroup about media issues, specifically how their issues are covered in the state's main paper. And they meet once a month and they talk about how the coverage they think is, is accurately or inaccurately described their work and the causes that they're interested in. And they're large enough that they actually were able to ask the publisher to meet with them on a Zoom and talk about, because they're, 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 they're that bre they had that kind of breadth and cachet, and the publisher met with them and they actually formed this relationship and they were successful and actually having pieces taken off the website because they found that they reached out and said the framing of this police brutality case is not in line with you know, fact and it's more of the following the police take on things as opposed to the actual events. And so they'd had, they had built enough of a relationship on a larger scale. So we do it more on a one-on-one -on -one off and try and make some outreach and gently nudge. Uh, but it's possible is a group, and we can see that firsthand with this other group that has built some accountability with some of their local papers and saying, we really, you know, we applaud you for doing this, but your coverage of this is not okay. And they definitely had a front page digital headline texting, text changed, uh, just the way it was framed was really inappropriate and didn't, didn't capture truth. So, so to answer your question, Dan, we definitely know this is long game. Um, we have seen things changed. We know there's a higher order way with when you have some connection to the institution itself uh, to influence coverage. Um, form relationships, in other words. Form relationships. And so, for example, I, I think I put one in here. Did I put one in here? Let me just scan. I think I had one. I'll use one here. So this is one that really got to me. This is, we're going to count this as, uh, it's not a medical setting. We're going to pretend this is a HIPAA protected uh, so basically, this was with a journalist. Um, it's not considered to be private, but I just use this as an example. So I don't know who's been following uh, this fellow named Ray Epps, but basically he was an insurrectionist, attempted to storm the, uh, did storm the Capitol. Um, and there was a very interesting right-wing disinformation campaign to make him seem like he was part of a false flag operation by the FBI. They tried to basically, right-wingers tried to make him seem like he was the one uh, somehow who had done something uh, to, to, as, a, as, a, as, a, as an FBI agent to create the insurrection, right? Um, so in any event, so his life was kind of ruined. So the whole right-wing information ecosystem turned on this guy and he's turned into, for whatever reason, he was actually, I believe on, I didn't watch it on CBS recently, like the story has got legs. The right-wing wallpaper ecosystem is very powerful. So these stories don't go away. Um, so basically, this was the New York Times headline. It said, new evidence undercuts January 6th instigator conspiracy theory. We knew this guy did not lead the, in, did not create the insurrection as part of him being like a mole working with the FBI, right? Like this is like layers of disinformation in this, but that the New York Times uses its power in its platform to write something like this. So what we do is we reframe things to show people who haven't really seen this. Because if you read that quick and you're scanning through your phone, okay, new evidence undercuts January 6th instigator conspiracy theory. All right, that sounds reasonable. No, let's read what actually happened. Can sure. Recordings released to defense lawyers disproved assertions by prominent Republicans that an Arizona na man named Ray Epps was a federal informant and helped start the Capitol riot. So there's like, they you tried to blame everything on this one guy as part of a the overarching right-wing conspiracy theory that this was all like a a, 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 a a plan a conspiracy to by someone else that the that all those people you saw storming this guy helped the fbi plan that so this is a level of insane but the new york times doesn't go that far so we reframe this that means just re-edit it if we had written this headline to be more informative right-wing disinformation campaign we have to understand that, that this conspiracy theories do not just spontaneously pop out of the sky. These are actually created, amplified, and formulated for effect. So don't get me started on the word conspiracy theory, because to me, that's a tell that somebody who writes that word has no idea about the right-wing ecosystem and right-wing media ecosystem and how it functions. Okay, it's useful, 
but it doesn't capture the upstream events of why we have these conspiracy theories, who's creating them, and why they're being created. They're creating critical race theory as a conspiracy theory. It wasn't being taught at any grade schools, but it turned into a disinformation campaign, right? So yeah, anyway. Sanford, so, Sanford has a question. Oh, sure, go ahead, Sanford. I was just going to share with you uh, 60 minutes. Maybe I don't know if you saw that or not, but they did a very, very uh, uh, wonderful. It's a little hard to hear you, Sanford. Oh, let's see. Is, is that any better? It's a little better. Yeah. Um, 60 minutes did a really, really wonderfully done uh, segment on, on Ray Epps and the whole story. And actually, it was the Sunday evening uh, right before Tucker Carlson got fired in, in, a, in a decent part of. Of that story uh, focused on Tucker Carlson's role, role in um, denigrating and just demonizing uh, Ray Epps. But if, if you ever get a chance, that 60 minute segment is probably accessible. Um, it's pretty fair coverage. That's good to hear. Thank you for that. I, I'd heard of it. Uh, I, I, I appreciate the, the, the tip. I haven't seen it. Um, so, using this as an example, there were made, so this is the New York Times who could have done something similar, right? Disproving that Ray, like, this is recordings were released that proves the Ray Epps conspiracy theory was a lie. But the New York Times didn't say that. New evidence undercuts the conspiracy theory. No, they disproved it. OK, <laughs> like you can use your language, big boy. You get paid a six figure salary, a byline at the New York Times. You can say it disproves it. Right. Like it wasn't a really strong you know, we're not turning like the theory of relativity or gravity on its head with this release. We know it disproves it. OK, but he didn't say that. And also I'm frustrated as are others. So I, I on Twitter, a lot of the, 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 the journalists are accessible if you're nice. So I said, hi, Alan, interesting piece on the disinfo campaign. Right. Tucker Carlson and those folks created this to turn right wing folks attention and energies to blaming this dude. It was a campaign. So it wasn't just a conspiracy theory that is this spontaneous organic thing that just comes to being and travels the universe. This is strategy. So disinformation campaign is something that New York Times writers should be thinking about. So I said, hi, Alan, interesting piece on the disinfo campaign by right wing media and Republicans re -apps. Question, why don't you call it disinformation and why instead settle for conspiracy theory? Right. Conspiracy theory is neither here nor there. It is a true, it's not, maybe it's not true, but it's devoid of the intent and strategy, as long as you use the word conspiracy theory. When you start saying a disinformation campaign, now you have, you're forced to recognize that this came from somewhere with an intention. But if you're, that, that you're a journalist and you can't make that distinction, you are, in my opinion, failing at your duty to provide context because the right has strategically decided this is how they're going to run their narrative warfare, right? They're going to create things that aren't true and pump them through their ecosystem. And then the job of legacy media like the New York Times should be to insulate folks from those conspiracy theories slash disinformation campaigns, not soft pedal that something's going on. So I went on a huge tangent. Yeah, calling, but put, calling, it a, calling it a theory is, is soft pedaling it in the sense of, well, anything can be a theory. You know, <laughs> you can make up is theories. It, People hear theories all the time, but to is, say it, that it there's it, a different purpose. Yeah. There's a, it's devoid of intent and willful strategy to deceive and manipulate for power, to mobilize voters, to mobilize people to come out, to take over the school boards. Critical race theory is a that how that became a, a, a campaign issue that Republicans can and will continue to run on is a giant disinformation campaign. And it's super effective. So I use this as my example. He responded, fair enough. Thanks for the nudge. So I consider myself an official nudger. Okay. So that, that's the way that's the way to think about this. Did he change anything? No. No, I didn't, I didn't. no not really. Um, but the idea is, is so I will give you another example. I have been infuriated with the coverage of the Washington Post about voter suppression at scale for the last two years by the Republican Party. 
there is a journalist at the, at the Washington Post whose beat is voting. She refuses to use the word voter suppression. We've exchanged some emails and it's mind boggling and that, that it, is, it is not, she, it, she, I have not been able to nudge. She has used instead of the words voter suppression, voting hurdles, oh, right? So those people in Georgia on those eight hour lines now not allowed to get water, she <laughs> considers those hurdles. Hurdles, that's nice. Okay, so we're not uniformly successful, but we are putting these people, we are calling them out and shining that light on their coverage. Okay, so I know we've got a couple other things to cover. We're going to skip over how corporate media normalizes stuff. That's what I was talking about, how Donald Trump and now Ron DeSantis have just become like, well, because they're running, we're just going to make them seem like they're just the de facto candidates as opposed to authoritarians that literally would end American democracy with their v explicit visions for this country. Um, next up, uh, sorry, I got off. Uh, so what else do we, oh, this was another one. I mean, this guy writes for the New York Times. He has, it's granted it's the opinion, but the New York Times pays this guy to write opinion pieces. Ross Douthat, he's notorious. He trolls liberals. He realfully says some of this stuff just to get people to respond to his stuff. But can anything end the voting wars? This is his perspective in 2021 after seeing what's going on in Georgia. As battles over voting rules burn hotter, the stakes are lower than both sides seems to think. No, we're going to call those Republican assaults on voting rights. I don't think uh, in any event, I don't want to go too far down, but getting you see the framing, how important framing is. That is a completely different piece with a different headline. And humans are making those decisions. Next up, new paragraph. How do we what's the macro structure here? We have an FCC that can do some things. It can't fix the stuff we just talked about in newspapers and news organizations, but it can help democratize media and media ownership. Right now, I don't know, are you folks familiar with Sinclair News? Is that something that you folks have ever seen a little bit? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Basically, mm -hmm. it's a conglomerate that is buying local news stations, all your local ABC, CBS, NBC affiliates, yeah. buying them up and then turning them into right-wing favoring uh, news outlets. In addition, they are laying off local staff, homogenizing content, and basically uh, compromising the information that people are getting on their local news. That, that is one issue, how the FCC can change media ownership. It could say that there should be no such thing, and there used to be rules on how many TV stations any corporation used to own. The FCC has been co-opted by four years of Republican dominance and the, during the Trump administration. And now, unfortunately, for two years of the Biden administration, it has been neutered at 2-2. Two, 2-2 two. Two, two does not allow the FCC to operate on our behalf, Americans. Joe Biden nominated somebody who is very over, uh, very qualified. Her name is Gigi Sohn. She worked as Tom Wheeler, a former FCC chair's attorney. And so we have made the staffing of the FCC one of the issues that we think is very important. So we've engaged people in calling, initially it was calling senators. We were doing electoral type work, call your senators, but actually around the FCC, around media issues. Unfortunately, after a year and a half and a gigantic disinformation campaign, slandering her, really misrepresenting her credentials, her agenda, which she did not have, being they basically created gigantic disinformation campaigns about her values uh, and her being the first LGBTQ openly commissioner would have been. Uh, they basically, after a year and a half, year and almost a year and a half, she withdrew her nomination two months ago. Where does that leave us? Is Joe Biden has to nominate someone else because we're still stuck at 2-2 and we can't render decisions. Something else the FCC could do that might make people's ears go up on this call, it could make regulations about carriage fees, about how Fox, one of the main resources that subsidize Fox are the monthly fees, whether you watch it or not, that you're forced to pay. So the FCC has some potential power that is not being wielded. It has the potential to change media ownership. It used to be that Rupert Murdoch, Ronald Reagan helped Rupert Murdoch after Rupert Murdoch helped Ronald Reagan. I can give that lesson to one of you if you want to come back and I'll talk about the 1980s and the origins of Fox. But Basically, it used to be that Rupert Murdoch could not own as many news channels, local news channels, a newspaper, a publishing house, 
like if you look at the, how large he has influentially has become, one of the reasons he's been able to float Tucker Carlson basically at a loss is he's got infrastructure that supports the rest of the beast. So in any event, so FCC is something we rally people around. Um, next up, I want to close with this. I think I know we're coming up and we can still do Q&A, but I want if I was going to leave you with something else, it's I'd really like you folks to be thinking about your local news outlets. This is a passion of ours. We've got a member, Jonathan, who's really made this. He's created a database of all 50 states, searchable, vetted, vetted to the best of our abilities without subscribing and looking at like F, you know, uh, filings specifically, um, or help you to get feedback. But what this is, and I'd like to show you, is basically a way to help people remember that supporting your local news outlets is a form of activism. It's not just a place to get information. It supports journalists. And without journalists, we don't have a democracy. So we're looking at this both from an individual perspective and also from a democracy perspective. There's also legislative solutions that are being discussed and we're involved in those. And that's one of the things Bob McChesney is gonna to come to our group and next week is gonna talk about is he's one of the kind of the godfathers of thinking of some of the solutions. Well, how do we get more local news outlets? We've seen the hemorrhaging across whatever, something along the lines of 70% fewer newspapers than there were 25 years ago. Well, we can't, that is not sustainable for democracy. If everybody is getting their news from ABC, CBS, NBC, and Facebook, and now like a chat GPT derivative of what's going on in the world, nobody's gonna be for the better there. So I'm gonna suggest and ask you all to look at this local journalism directory we've built, drop Ohio in down the menu, but these are some highlights. Number one, local journalism pays you back. Investing in local journalism saves you money, saves your community in money, keeps your community safer. And we have a nice little list of literal, all the different reasons we should be thinking as engaged citizens as supporting local journalism as part of democracy activism. It's not just some place to get information. It matters, holds power to account, et cetera. Um, so less polarization. There's data on this, actually. This isn't just like we think this. There is data to support that more robust local news is better for the community. Less polarizing. When you start reading what's going on in your community by somebody who's in that community, the person you'll see at the tractor pull on Sunday is the same person who's covering the high school football game is going to tell you why Build Back Better might actually be good because some bridges that haven't been repaired in 30 years are actually going to get fixed, right? So it's actually more trusted news. You get better voter engagement. People feel like they're more connected to their community and representatives actually pay attention. If you've got local news organizations, right? They like to perform and have a platform. So it's actually good for democracy. So I'll just give you a little list uh, of how this democracy works. We've got this cool little map. Can, I think you can still see my map. Here's you folks in Ohio. And you can click on it and we're reminding folks that we are you know we've got and we've done our best to categorize them it's imperfect uh but we've done the best we can um but uh we've got the ohio capital journal cover state government la prensa uh bilingual english spanish i own ohio center square akron reporter black owned cincinnati herald black owned um, so we broke it down because some folks would, you know, like to be able to kind of understand some of the backbone and the, and, the, and the priorities of some of the outlets. Signal Cleveland, Columbus Free Press. So that's a decent number of we consider, you know, we ask folks to consider if they've got the means to, to invest and subscribe to local news outlets. Also, as I said earlier, a story for another day, there are legislative solutions. We have to think of this as a democracy issue. If we purely leave this to the bottom line and uh, our democracy will be the worse for it. This is just similar to as we're realizing that there's some social valuable products and services okay. that we can't leave to the free market. Okay, yeah. sorry, go ahead, Marty. Let's go back oh, to just... full screen. Yeah. I just wanted to put in a slight plug for the Cleveland Plain Dealer, which I guess is listed as cleveland.com on there. I, okay. I have been listening to a podcast they do, and I, sub I just recently subscribed to that. But... Okay. And Chat. You're on mute, Chat. Sorry about that. Uh, this was kind of off the wall. Um, 
I don't know if your organization's growing, but we're having trouble growing ours. Uh, do you have any ideas on uh, how to help grow an organization such as ours? Great question. Yeah, I think people are burned out. I think there's been a lot going on. Um, so coming from you know my last six years in different capacities of activists, every group that I know is in a uh, in, a, in a recoil phase. I so where we're thinking about doing things is we've just started to list some of our special events on Eventbrite to see if there are people that haven't been um, engaged in civic work or this kind of our kind of work, you know, because we're kind of fishing from the same pond. You know, we're not you know like we're going to send you all invites to come to our events and you can send us invites to come to your <laughs> events and you know that doesn't increase our numbers so i agree i think one of the things that we're we're taking stock of our organization right now we're doing a, a basically an internal assessment we've been doing it for the last two months now we wrote a guide what's our vision what do we think our strategies are and one of the pieces of our strategy is is explicitly that is is how do we get folks to engage in our work um, I think that getting more younger people like college folks who have a vested interest in, in a lot of this stuff and, and looking at causes, our work is specifically, you know, we think that by getting people who are interested in climate and repro rights and, and, you know, racial justice to recognize that media is something they need to be thinking about. So to get outside of the, like, usual circles of like democracy folks or voting registration folks but like the issue folks but them to see the importance of what we're doing okay but it is the secret yeah. sauce if i if i had two two wishes to to improve the, our reach and uh, the power of what we do it would be pr because i don't think we're very good as people fighting for democracy to get people to understand what we do enough to actually want to do what we do. A lot of people are like, oh, that's, that's, oh, you can do such good work. And it's like, that's not what I'm looking for. I, I don't need to hear that you think what we're doing is good. I need you to get off your ass and sign up for our calls and like actually call the FCC and do like we're doing, realizing that this is just an aside. Did you know, so one of the things we're doing right now, our action is to call the White House and ask Joe Biden to nominate someone else for the FCC. Really simple ask. The White House actually call line is only open Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. I asked the woman on the call, I said, why, wait, why are you only open? Like, you know, we got a three, $27 trillion deficit in the, you know, hundred, you know, trillion dollar military budget. Why, why is that? She said, actually not enough people call. We don't, we don't. I was like, well, well I'm going to keep calling. In any event, the point being is not enough people are actually doing this stuff. Right. So, so how does, so last point on this, I don't think enough people know there's a problem and you have to show them what they can do. People don't want to come. Everybody's time is busy. Everybody's stressed out. People are burnt out. And finding discrete actions that people can engage in relatively quickly and feel like they're productive, I think, is the way to get them to come back. We can get people one and done, get them on our newsletter and never see them again, but making feel like they did something. Mm -hmm. Since we're riffing on that, can I just share one more thing? Since I think that's a really important sure. question. There's a group that I did some work before independent of my life in, in, in media and democracy. Uh, they're called uh, Civic Sundays. They're based in California. I don't know if you know them at all. And they have a motto. It's basically show up, do something, feel good. So people get on the call every Sunday at one o'clock and there's text banking, phone banking, postcard writing. I think now that post COVID they're like getting a little more. And so people know that they're gonna show up for their one hour mm. and, uh, and they know there's something to be done then. And they're going to get told what to do. So just to give you a sense, I don't know how much kind of electoral work and that sort of stuff you're, you're doing, but some people like that, like, I know I'm putting in an hour, I'm going to do my mitzvah, this is my hour, and like, I'm done. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions right now? Well, Mila, you've, you've given us a lot to think about, and I, I my brain is certainly thinking. Uh, and I, I think uh, that was an excellent question shot. I, I think we could probably take a take a meeting or two to for ourselves to talk about how could we better focus and come up with some more specific strategies. We do letters to the editor, we do our papers, we do uh, we certainly list events people can be 
become involved in that type of thing, which I think is useful. Um, we do send it out to about a thousand people and still around 350, 400 people actually supposedly look at it, <laughs> actually our email. Uh, so they perhaps there's more engagement than we realize, but I think we can improve. And I think Mila, you, you've certainly given me some thoughts, some ideas. So thank you very much. Uh, appreciate your being with us and you're welcome to stay if you like. We've got a, a little bit more time here uh, for the group. We have some more events we need to get through. <laughs> oh, I just uh, want to Ruth? say thank you. I just love the idea. Show up, do something, feel good. We, I, I'm, I'm this Christian person. I'm not supposed to feel good and happy and proud about what I do. And I'm supposed to suffer. Oh, it's so backwards. But, and then just show up because I'm going to do something. I already told you I would be depressed or rolled up in a ball or in a psych ward if I didn't do something. And that's partially why I come to this. Well, you, maybe the whole reason why I come. Plus, you're all great people. But it's a, I love that idea. I just want to just, reinforce it thank you absolutely i'll send us uh, thank you for that i mean the, the the one piece that i've definitely found and i agree it's similar to what you've had here is we've got a core and that core makes it all possible like we've got there's me and six other people i really like them we really like each other uh you know and it's inspiring and so democracy is community and that's the thing that i'm learning as i've gone through and like you guys are the core it sounds like and the question is is how do you accommodate other people to do your kind of work um and and it's not easy and i'll send dan i'll send you the link of the the, the civic sunday folks if that 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 may be something that that model that you, you folks work on and uh, i think i've liked it because i've seen a ton of activist stuff uh myself having organized some volunteered in a ton uh and i i think that model works really well because people done this know everybody likes scheduled stuff they don't want to be like this week it's the next month it's this wednesday is this it's actually you can do this <laughs> just do mm -hmm. it so you want right. to you're good yeah definitely send me your slides also okay be, great be, um and and then i'll it. send in the, in the slides is our contact info we've got events coming up um we meet on mondays you're all invited to come next monday the 15th does not conflict with your work um so if you want to come at seven o'clock eastern and kind of thank you constance for connecting a, a group with us and i really appreciate that because that's really where this needs to go so what I, my personal goal is to take and do the kind of work that we're doing together tonight is just build some more community around this concept of, wait, there's a lot of influences that are headwinds to the change that we need. And we have to address those headwinds because we're not gonna be successful unless we do. So, so thank you, Constance. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, everyone here. Keep fighting the good fight. I hope to see you all again. Um, come to any of our events. I look forward to hear the work you're doing. I'll share you shy. I'll share. I'll share slides. I'll even share last night's slide deck. I ran our hour and a half session. You'll kind of see what our sessions are like if you want to do that, because uh, we make slides every two weeks, so you can kind of steamroll at your own leisure, and you'll see some of the actions we have, including the number for the White House Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and say, Joe, you're doing a great <laughs> job. We appreciate the work you're doing. You've saved democracy, but you got to get somebody on the FCC. You cannot wait two fucking years and have no FCC for your entire term. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thank, all right. you. all right. Thank you all. Anyway, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording. You, you, make sure you don't keep that piece of me telling that Joey's doing great, uh, but you got to have an effing uh, fourth, fifth commissioner.